You're listening to Inside the War Room, Case Studies in Crisis. Join us as we explore true stories and reveal new insights with our guests, key figures in some of the largest and most complex events of our time. In this episode... The next morning when I got to the White House about six, I think some, six something, the president looked at me and said, let me tell you how to do your job today. <laughs> and he said, you're in charge of all communications from the U.S. government. Uh, I want you to oversee everything that's said, and we're at war against terror, and you're in charge of communicating this war. And now, it's time to go inside the war room with your hosts, Shireen Abadi, Michael Estevez, and Jordan Strauss. Welcome to Inside the War Room. I'm Michael Estevez. There are only a few people in the world who have ever held the trusted position of counselor to the President of the United States and even fewer who held the role during a terrorist attack on American soil. Today, Jordan speaks to Karen Hughes, counselor to President George W. Bush and later Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy, and who today is Worldwide Vice Chair of Burson Conan Wolf, a producer of this podcast. You're about to hear Karen Hughes' first-hand account of what happened the morning of September 11, 2001 and in the days that followed, and her unique role as counselor to the President during this momentous time in American history. Now, let's listen as Jordan goes inside the war room with Karen Hughes. So today on Inside the War Room, we have one of our more well-known guests, and that guest is Karen Hughes, who occupied a series of very senior positions in the United States government and worked in the closest possible proximity to one of our most consequential recent United States presidents. Uh, Karen, welcome to Inside the War Room. Thank you, thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. So Karen, we have a number of listeners who work in public relations, who work in crisis management, or who work in politics. And uh, you've done all three of those things. And I was wondering if before we got underway, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your early life and how you got to Austin and how you ended up in Washington and, and, and the stops you took along the way. Sure, so I um, grew up as an army brat, lived different places around the world. Uh, got to Dallas when my dad came home from Vietnam, went to high school there, was tired of moving, so went to SMU. <laughs> um, <laughs> as a three-year student, they had a three-year degree plan um, majored in English and journalism. Uh, journalism was kind of a late addition. Um, I, during my second year there, I took a class in radio television news writing from a man who was the news director at the local NBC affiliate. And that, I fell in love with the art of um, marrying words and pictures in a way that I thought communicated uh, better than either alone. And so I prevailed on him to let me do an internship at his TV station. Uh, when I graduated in May, they hired me, and so I started my career as a television reporter, spent about seven and a half years there, uh, and as a reporter, became fascinated with the political process and covering the, the politicians that I covered and realizing the impact all the decisions that were made in the political process had on people's lives. Um, so I, in 1984, I had the opportunity to go to work as the Texas press coordinator for the Reagan-Bush campaign. Senator Tower was the co-chairman of that, and his press secretary was a friend of mine and reached out and, and asked me to come to work for them, and so I did. Um, great leap into the unknown, a six-month job. <laughs> would, would probably wouldn't have done it had I not been married. Uh, I just got married the fall before. Um, and from there, proceeded after the campaign to do a, a series of kind of political odd jobs. You know, I said, handed out leaflets for a friend who was running for county judge in the park and ride when I was six months pregnant. <laughs> Did all kinds of things like that, local <laughs> local campaigns, things like that. Um, and eventually, uh, a, a guy that I worked for in his campaign for mayor of Dallas became the executive, uh, became the chairman of the state Republican Party. He hired me to first do media work for them and then eventually to move to Austin and become the executive director. So I was, for three years as executive director, my job was to try to pave the way to elect a Republican as governor of Texas. Um, and that Republican uh, 
was George became George W. Bush when he won the Republican primary. Um, at about the same time, my longtime boss, the chairman, decided he was not going to run for re-election, and I thought the incoming chairman should have the right to pick their own executive director because the two worked so closely together. So I announced that I would be leaving the Republican Party without really knowing what I was going to be doing. And uh, George W. Bush prevailed on me to come to work for his campaign um, as communications director, and I almost didn't do it. Uh, because I knew how, I thought it was in some ways a step backward because I'd been in a management job where I'd overseen everything, not just press. And um, I, uh, my son was six years old and I knew how consuming campaigns are, but I finally decided I'd given three years of my life to be executive director, so I ought to finish the, to, to pave the way for us to elect a Republican governor. So I ought to finish the job. Even his mother had said that he couldn't beat Ann Richards. And so I went to work for him and we just became... <laughs> We had a wonderful experience. I called it the campaign of joy. Um, and uh, when he won, he looked at me and said, you're coming with me. And so I went to the government. I had no intention when I started out of going into the government, um, but I did. Um, and so uh, became his communications director for his time in the governor's office. And then when he decided to run for president, uh, it took me along with him. Uh, I was, I was, uh, my title on the campaign was communications director, but I was really one of three people. The press called us the Iron Triangle who ran the campaign. It was Carl Rove, who was our strategist, Joe Albaugh, who was our campaign manager, and, and me. And Joe had a more colorful way of describing us. He called us the brain, the brawn, and the bite. <laughs> I was the bite. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, that's it. And then I went to the White House with President Bush and then came home to Texas, and then he prevailed on me when my son went to college to go back to the State Department. And so I ended up serving as Undersecretary of State uh, for several years uh, during his second term. Now, Karen, uh, your role at the White House was, was counselor to the president, right? Correct. What is the counselor to the president? I mean, is it just is, is it the, the one or two people who get their names printed on the special presidential phone on, on speed dial? I mean, what, what is that job? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what he, well, I, I, I asked him that. My second day at the White House, I said, tell me exactly what you mean by this counselor to the president. He, he wanted, I oversaw all the White House communications operation, the press secretary, the media affairs, the speech writing, the, um, all that. Um, but I said, what do you mean by this counselor thing? And he, he wanted it to imply a broader policy role. And so the way he described it was, I want you to go to every meeting where a major decision is being discussed. I want you to tell the people in the room the principles that I will use to, to evaluate that decision, and then I want you to tell me what you really think I should do. Hmm. So that was my job. <laughs> so I mean, to be the, the president's policy conscience outside of the room and to help him build his policy, policy conscience, conscience inside it, it sounds like. Well, I think, I think to give, to, to, I knew him really well, and he knew that. And so to, to tell people in the room who might not know him as well, who might be experts on something like nuclear waste, but might not know President Bush or his principles, um, to tell them what factors would be important to him in, in evaluating the decision, and then to give him my best judgment of what I thought, knowing him, that, that he should do. So day to day, I mean, how much time were you spending with the president? Oh, a lot. A lot. Like a lot. I mean, I, a lot of yeah, a lot of meetings. Um, we we had a morning meeting every morning with the president, the vice president, Condi Rice, me, and the chief of staff. Um, and then later, Carl was added to that meeting. Um, to basically, that started during the uh, early days when we had the China spy plane. Remember, the spy plane was shot sure down do. over Hainan Island. Yeah. And uh, we realized that we, we really needed, we had a senior staff meeting of, of our most senior staff at 7.15 and then a, a larger senior staff meeting at 7.30. But we realized we needed a meeting with really the senior advisory team. And so that's when we added the, the daily meeting with the president, the vice president, Condi, the chief of staff, and me after, after he'd had all his national security briefings and things. Yeah, and then that, that White House was notorious for starting its days incredibly early, if, Ugh, if I recall correctly. It. I was a night person in a, in a White House full of or, early morning people. So, you know, that's interesting that you raised China. I mean, I think a lot of people think, when they think of, of national security and uh, George W. Bush's administration, they think about 9-11 and Iraq and Afghanistan. But the, that was a major test I think it was was a month or two after he was elected, right? It was like in early or March, after, after he, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, 
And of course, been, I, I, before he'd had time to, before he'd met China's leaders, um, and so it was a very, you know, um, he had not met them in person at that point, and uh, yeah, it wasn't, it was an early, very, very tense, difficult time. The China incident that, that Karen's referring to involves a, a, a mild mid-air collision forcing what was publicly reported to be a United States American uh, electronic surveillance aircraft to force a, a landing in China where I think that the aircraft and crew were detained for, I can't remember if it was eight days or 11 days or. I want to say it was 10 or 11 is what I think. Yeah. yeah so, you know, that's, that's sort of an interesting formative experience. I mean, I, I think it, it, it's not common for a president to be tested like that in the first few months. It sounds like you gave a lot of thought to the container that you were going to use to manage that and other crises, crises right off the bat. You know, with the, with the morning meetings and, and senior well, we team realized meetings that we needed to have a chance to talk about what were we going to say today, you know, and what were, what are we going to do about this situation today, and and that that meeting gave us the opportunity to do that. Did that meeting continue to stand through the administration? Yes. Or through your time? Well, I, through my time there, it did. I know, and I presume it continued after I left. Interesting. So, if we could move forward just a couple of months, and talk about the September 11th attacks. Could you, could you tell us a little bit about what was going on with you that, that, that morning? You know, the president went to Florida and I was scheduled to go with him. September 10th is my wedding anniversary. And he left on the afternoon of September 10th and I had never missed a anniversary dinner with my husband in our entire marriage. And I thought, I thought long and hard about it and I thought, you know, little things are a big deal sometimes, especially when you've got a big, powerful job. And so I, at the last minute, sent my deputy to Florida with the president, and I stayed in Washington to have my anniversary dinner with my husband. And so the morning of 9-11, I was, the, our housing secretary had asked me to come to a, um, since I wasn't going to be traveling with the president, Mel Martinez had asked me to come to represent the White House at a Habitat for Humanity bill that he was doing which entailed me wearing blue jeans, and President Bush didn't allow blue jeans in the West Wing. So I took the opportunity to skip the early morning 715, 730 mm -hmm. staff meeting, and I was in the shower um, getting ready to go to meet Mel Martinez at the Habitat, which I think was scheduled for 930 or 10. Um, and my husband brought me the phone and said, uh, Jill Angela, who was my White House Chief of Staff, Jill's on the phone, she needs to talk to you. And uh, a plane has hit the World Trade Center. And my husband knows better than to take messages like that because all I'll do is ask, if I'm a former reporter, I'll ask him all kinds of questions that he doesn't know how to answer. So he brought me the phone in the shower. And uh, Jill was at the White House and told me, Karen, a plane, a plane has hit the World Trade Center. So I immediately hung up and, and called my deputy, Dan Bartlett, who was in, um, in Florida with the president and said a plane has hit the World Trade Center. And I remember us both thinking, speculating, you know, must be small plane, heart attack, something went wrong. Yeah. And uh, then I was watching, I, I went and turned on the TV, and I was watching as the second plane hit the second tower. And I immediately called Dan and said, Dan, another plane hit, hit another tower. And I'll never forget, he asked me, what kind of plane? And at the time, I thought, what a stupid question, you know, who, who, who came, what do you mean, you know? But he was trying to figure out, you know, what it was. And I remember saying to him, uh, I don't know, a, a big plane like a passenger plane. And for some reason, it never occurred to me, I guess it was just too, too horrible that there were actually passengers on the plane. Um, I, I, just, I just thought it was a big one like a, a passenger plane. Um, so you're still at home when this is, when this is happening, right? Yes. Karen, did you have um, Secret Service at that time? I did not. I never had Secret Service. Really? Okay. Uh, uh, and so you, you drove yourself to the White House? No, the, actually that morning, the, because they had evacuated the White House and basically shut off downtown, the vice president sent a military driver to pick me up. Okay. So how much time did you have between the second plane hitting and, and getting picked up? I really don't know. I don't really remember this. I don't, I don't really know. Um, I was on the phone the whole time. So I was on the phone with Dan and Ari, and Ari read me the statement they were proposing for the president to make. And um, I remember that very clearly because they 
they said uh, they led with a sentence that said something about America today was the victim, and I said we're not victims. Um, and so we, we changed that. Um, when they, I was on the phone with them until they took off leaving Florida, and when they took off leaving Florida, I had no idea. I thought they were coming back to Washington. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as I know, they thought they were coming back to Washington. We did not know that the vice president and president had talked and rec the vice president had recommended that the president not come back um, because of the potential, you know, for a threat on him. Um, and, and so we did not know that. So I didn't know until they landed in, I guess it was Louisiana, Barksdale or somewhere, um, that they were not coming back to Washington. Um, I remember trying to reach the president on the drive to the White House. So it took me a, a while to reach the White House. For one thing, I, uh, I always called the, the vein switchboard. And when they evacuated the White House, they evacuated all the operators. Mm -hmm. So nobody was <laughs> answering the main switchboard. And I didn't know how to call the signal the military yeah. switchboard. Yeah. yeah, I'd never used it before. And so I was, they were trying frantically to find me. I was trying to call them um, and Eventually, Josh, Josh Bolton, our deputy chief of staff, got me and said, the vice president wants you, you know, is sending a car to get you. Um, I remember as we drove back into the city, I could see the Pentagon burning. And I remember telling the, the military driver, I'm, I'm sure you have friends there. And he said, yes, ma'am. And one of the most stark images to me of the whole day was the scene as we arrived in downtown Washington, it was like a ghost town. There was no mm -hmm. one. It, 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 all I saw were people in black, you know, men dressed in black, the, the, I guess it was Secret Service or military or someone, and holding guns. And it looked like, it reminded me like of a foreign capital after a coup. Yeah. And it just seemed impossible that this was downtown Washington, you know, the home of freedom and democracy. And we came to a checkpoint and uh, the, the driver, had, the, the people had been told not to let anybody in. And so the driver said, well, this is Karen Hughes. I'm taking her to the vice president. And so he had to radio his supervisor. And I heard his supervisor say, are you sure it's Karen Hughes? How do you know? And the guy looked in and said, yeah, I've seen her on TV. <laughs> so <laughs> that's how they identified me. <laughs> and then, of course, I arrived at the White House in the West Wing, and there was no one there. They actually took me to the east side for some reason, not the main doors at the west mm -hmm. wing. They drove into the east wing. And I'd never been in the east wing doors before. And uh, there was nobody there. And so I thought, you know, this is not a day you want to sneak up on anybody. So I right. opened the door and yelled, hello, you know, is anybody here? And two Secret Service agents came running. And then they, they took, I, you know, told them I was there for, to, meet the vice president, and they took me to the, uh, the emergency bunker, which I'd never been to before. I mean, obviously, it was mm -hmm. still early, and I guess we hadn't had time to have a tour, you know? Right. I'd never been there. So yeah. they took me uh, through a series of what kind of seemed like submarine hatches down to the, uh, the bunker. Right. And um, so you get into the bunker, and there are there are photographs which were declassified a couple oh, of years ago. There's, yeah, let me, let me mention one yeah. more thing. There's, there's one mm -hmm. more significant thing about the drive to the, to the, to the um, White House. I had been watching TV at home, so I realized that to the American people, it looked like government was not functioning, right? It, the white, people, we, you saw the pictures of people running from the White House. Um, right. you, the State Department was shut down after there was a rumor that a car, there was a car bomb. The Defense Department had been hit. Um, and so I realized that we had to brief the country of what the government was doing in response. And so I tried, I, I knew that uh, if, I, if I talked to the president, he would want that. Um, and so I tried to call him. Um, and I tried, and the operator ended up telling me, um, ma'am, I'm sorry, we cannot reach Air Force One. <laughs> Right. So that's and that's a not well known detail of that day that there was apparently some sort of failure on the communication systems on Air Force One. Correct. I guess this was before it was possible to get television or anything right. like that on Air Force One. For me, it was very, very, very unsettling because that was right about the same time the rumor came in that the president's plane had been targeted. And they remember there was a mistranslation of the use of the word angel, which was the code name for the plane. Mm -hmm. And 
we thought that somebody had made a threat against Angel, and it turned out that was just the way the message was conveyed. But anyway, so, so that was a very unsettling moment for me because I thought maybe something had happened to him. I didn't know it was just a communications problem. And, and it had to have been, I mean, I think everybody experienced 9-11 differently. A lot of us knew people who, who died or who were injured or who were otherwise impacted. But, you know, when you have a, a catastrophe like that, it's hard to understand it in human terms unless you, you know somebody who's personally involved. So, you know, you're, you're on your way to the White House through a weird entrance in a military jeep in strange dystopian Washington on an otherwise beautiful cloudless day. And you can't find your friend, the president of the United States. Right. That, that, had, that had to have been terrifying. It was. It was. I just remember thinking, though, that I had to get a hold of the president and we had to brief the country because I got to the bunker and what I was witnessing was the government functioning very efficiently. Norm Mineta was on the telephone grounding mm -hmm. the planes, overseeing, mm -hmm. you know, the shutting down of all the flights. Um, the vice president was there with Condi. Um, it, it was very calm. Um, Josh Bolton was this, I guess, the ranking person in charge as the deputy chief of staff because Andy Card, the chief of staff, was with the president, um, and he was there. And I just remember, you know, somehow we've got to brief people. And uh, the vice president and Condi agreed, and they both said it should be me. And I remember thinking, no, it shouldn't, no, it shouldn't, no, no, not me. <laughs> and I suggested maybe Condi or the vice president should do it. And the vice president didn't think he should do it. And Condi didn't think she should do it. They both felt like um, people were used to me speaking for the president and that they would view me as someone who, you know, was, was a trustee, trusted spokesman for the president. Um, I think there may have also been, they didn't say it, but I think there may have also been some concern about, you know, they didn't want to create an Al Haig moment, right, where right. it look, looked like the, somebody was taking over or anything, and they felt, they felt like that I would be the, the best person. And so um, the minute I talked to the president, finally, he, he immediately agreed and said, yes, I think you have to brief um, and let people know. And Karen, how, how did you get in touch with the president? Do I don't remember whether he called me. He called me. Um, he convened a meeting when he landed in Nebraska. He convened a meeting of the National Security Council via uh, mm -hmm. secure um, Over civics, communication. Yeah. yeah, and I remember. I remember. So that was the first time I actually saw him that day, and he, he practically came through the. I mean, other than on TV, um, he practically came through the screen, and I'll never forget. He said, "We are at war against terror." And from this day forward, this is the priority of our administration. And I think he saw me, I guess, in the situation. I was in the situation with, with the, I, I wasn't part of the National Security Council, but I was, because I was in the bunker with the vice president, I was participating in that meeting. And as soon as it finished, he called me. And he said, don't you think, the first thing he said was, don't you think I need to get back to Washington? And I said, yes, absolutely. Um, because I felt like it was, you know, really, uh, unsettling for the country, for the president to be flying around the country. You know, it just, I, it, I didn't feel like that was, um, so I said, yes, absolutely. And he said, well, I'm coming back. And I said, okay, good. And then I, then I talked to him about what, you know, uh, do you think I need to brief? Uh, you know, he said, yes, I want you to brief. And so, um, I remember thinking that facts action would be reassuring to people. I remember thinking that the, the primary mission was to try to reassure the country after a terrible shock, right? And Karen, can we, can, can we dive into that for just a moment? What does reassuring the country mean to you in a situation like that? Because I, I think a lot of our listeners will not know that one of the results of sort of the post 9-11 study is that the you know, now not so newly formed Department of Homeland Security actually put together guidance which says this is exactly what the government needs to do following a major terrorist incident. Basically have like a recognizable high profile figure on the air briefing every hour, sharing what facts can be shared. But you know, this, this was all before that playbook was written. Right. So what, what, is, what does reassuring look like? Because you can't, you know, I mean, presumably you can't say then we know what's going on, everyone, everything's gonna be okay. Well, so that we had a we had a discussion about whether or not I would take questions. So 
the expectation when, when somebody goes out from the White House to brief is that you take questions from the reporters. And I couldn't take questions. We decided I shouldn't take questions because it would have been counterproductive to the mission of reassurance because the first question would be who did this and we weren't at that point prepared to answer. I had no idea. I mean, I, I, one of the things looking back is that I, I realized, you know, you go through a presidential campaign and you're asked every question under the sun that you can even imagine. We would never once ask about Al Qaeda, never, not once. Right. And I, and so, um, you know, I, I look back at my notebooks. I was, we were prepared. The president was in Florida at an education event. We were our d agenda for the fall was a domestic agenda, um, and so it completely came out of the blue to me. Um, I'd, I'd never heard a discussion of Al Qaeda. Um, it's funny later in his in his book, uh, Richard, what was his Rich name? Rich Clark. Yeah. Clark. Dick, Dick Clark. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so he said he was trying to get everybody's attention at the White House. I'd never even met Richard Clark. I mean, if he wanted to get the president's attention, everybody knew that I was kind of his confidant. You know, he never talked to me, so I had never heard of any of this, um, and uh, so it was a complete shock to me. Um, and I knew I couldn't answer the question about who did this. So I, I just decided. It, it's funny. I, I don't. You know, no one saw what I said. I just remember I, I, I got members of my staff to call the cabinet agencies and find out what they were doing uh, to respond. And um, I, I knew what Norm Mineta was doing because I was sitting there watching him. Um, mm -hmm. I, I sat at this old typewriter. I think it must have been a World War II era typewriter. This is down in the bunker. <laughs> in the bunker. Yeah, the pre-upgrade bunker, yeah. Yeah, that had like literally the ribbon, You could the ink was so bad that you could barely read the words on this page. But, <laughs> but I, ty and I typed up what I was going to say, and then I went and said it. They wouldn't let me do it from the White House because um, it was, um, it was, um, they thought it was still under threat. And so they, they literally took me out of the bunker with five Secret Service with men with their guns drawn around my body. I mean, like back, their backs to me, you know, facing mm -hmm. out. And they took me to the Justice Department. Yep. And I briefed from there. I have no recollection of other than, again, feeling this enormous responsibility to be reassuring to people. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I. Anyway, somewhere there, they gave me a conference room, and then I went out into the briefing room and briefed. And I'm actually just kind of curious if that if that typewritten sheet of paper is, is, is in the Bush Presidential Library somewhere, or uh, if, if, if you know. I think if, it if, is. I made a copy of it so I could keep it. I don't even know where it is. It's in one of my boxes somewhere, but I think they kept the original, yes. Oh, boy. Um, wow. So at that point, you know, it's not clear who did it. So all you can really share is kind of what's happening. That's yeah, that, that that's what I thought. I thought that I could just say what the government was doing to respond, that we had emergency people on the way to New York and into Pennsylvania and that we were doing this at the pen. You know, I just that's I, I just remember getting my staff to help collect me information about what we were doing in response and uh, and that that would be the best thing I could say. Because, again, I felt from seeing it at home, it sort of looked to the American people like the government had fled, you know, <laughs> and, um, and, and wasn't functioning. And yet what I was witnessing in the bunker was the very calm and efficient operation of, of government. I just knew that I had a job to do, and I did it. You know, I just, I just felt a very strong sense of responsibility um, to, to do what I do best um, to try to help the country. Um, I don't remember a moment of feeling giddy or anything. I do, you know, it was hard. I had to leave my family. Mm -hmm. um, my, my son had come home from school and I had to leave my husband and son and none of us ever questioned it. We just, I just knew I had to do it. I, I had a responsibility and it was, um, you know, probably more important that day than any other. I, I remember <laughs> a, a moment later in the week when on, on Friday morning, we had a series of events where the Secret Service thought there was another threat, and they pulled the president to the bunker. And on Friday morning, the head of our Secret Service detail ran in the Oval Office and said, we got to go, another plane's coming. And the president looked at him and said, I'm not going. They're not chasing me out of here anymore. And, and so I, I looked at him, and he had just ordered lunch, and he had been dieting. 
and he said uh, he ordered a hamburger. And I looked at him, I remember looking at him and saying, you might as well have cheese. <laughs> you know, I mean, yes. So I, was, I think that was kind of the attitude. I mean, it was just sort of a steely determination that we had to do our best, you know, for the country at that, in, that, in those moments. Now, uh, did you build out like kind of a battle rhythm with the, uh, with the comms team in the, in the hours and days after this happened? Well, we knew the president would have to address the nation. So when they finally let us back into my, my office, it was just chaos. There were like 20 people in there, and they were all yelling at what he needed to say. And <laughs> it was, you know, I couldn't think. And um, anyway, so, so we, had, we did pull together a draft that, that we got to him when he got back to the, to the, uh, uh, the White House that, that early that evening. Um, it, it's interesting, a, a minister friend of mine um, who was the minister of my church here in Austin, sent me uh, uh, the, the noon reflection that he had done for, for his congregation, and it included Psalm 23, and I realized that Psalm 23 um, should be part of the president's remarks. Um, and so, uh, but we couldn't, we couldn't find a Bible. Um, and so we, the, the version that, of course, the version in, in, that we had was in, some in the weird translation. What? <laughs> In the, in the White House? We, we couldn't find a Bible. Um, and, and so um, ever since that day, I've carried a Bible in my briefcase. <laughs> so <laughs> and, friend, and friends have given me like person-sized Bibles and things like that as I've told that story. But anyway, we had ended up with some weird translation. And the first thing the president said when he looked at his remarks was, get a better translation of Psalm 23. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, um, so we, the next morning, we were at the White House late. Um, the president had me stay for the National Security Council meeting, even though I was not normally a part of the council, but I attended a number of their meetings in, during that week. Um, and uh, the next morning when I got to the White House about six, I think some six something, the president looked at me and said, let me tell you how to do your job today. <laughs> and he said, you're in charge of all communications from the U.S. government. Uh, I want you to oversee everything that's said. and." We're at war against terror, and you're in charge of communicating this war. And, and so later that week, um, the president saw that the Treasury Secretary was scheduled to announce something. And I was at church. It was Sunday morning. And he, he called, and they pulled me out of church. And he said, why is the Treasury Secretary making this announcement? It's part of the war. And I said, well, because it's, a, it's about the financial aspects of the war. And he said, that's of an important part of the war. I should be making this announcement. So the next day, my, my deputy, Dan Bartlett, said, how did it get to be the president making this announcement? And I said, the president is how it got to be the president making this announcement. <laughs> so, so yes, but we had, a, you know, my staff met, we met daily. I, I was, my schedule was after the White House senior staff meeting, I would usually have a page of notes of things that I had to do. And so I would have a meeting with my communications team in my office. Um, right after that, um, and so usually about eight fifteen, eight thirty in the morning, my whole team and, and, would gather. So okay. while the president had his national security briefings, we met as a White House staff. So Andy Card, Condi, um, uh, you know, so so it was usually start off. Andy Card would start with anything he needed us to know. Condi would talk about any national security things we needed to know. Ari would talk about any press things that we needed to know, and then we'd go around the room. It was like Nick Cali, our legislative director, would fill us in on whatever was happening um, on the Hill that day. Um, you know, so it was all our senior people, um, in, including the I think the first lady's chief of staff was in there. So it was um, our both deputy chiefs of staff for policy and operations. Um, and so that was our. So we had a 715 meeting of, of, of like Andy, me, Joe Hagan, deputy, his deputies, so like the top six of us. The then most there was senior a 730 the senior, meeting. Yeah. That, then there was a 730 meeting of the bigger senior staff. The meeting that we added with the president, I think was ended up being like at 830 once it was eventually done. But that was not added until the China situation. So that would have been in like early March. Um, and then I would meet with my staff after that. Okay. Now, I just, um, the, the, you know, the volume of information that's coming in 
the days after 9-11. I, I've got to imagine that the threat picture is just skyrocketing. Everybody's ears are turned on. How do you sort through all that information and figure out what you need to communicate? I mean, I've, I've got to think you, you get into work and I mean, your, your briefing books must have looked like like 10 phone books on, on uh, you know, stacked on top of each other. Yeah, obviously there was a ton of things, but I mean, I try always first to think about what is the most important thing we need to communicate today and how do we use the president in, in doing that. And so, you know, on, on the, the 12th, we went to the Pentagon and we had the president there on site. On, um, uh, we early on felt it was important. We, we decided to do the National Day of Prayer um, on Friday. And uh, Mrs. Bush asked me to take charge of, of putting together the service and uh, picking the music for it. And she thought music would be very important as a source of comfort and so I, I, um, I did two things that I think were important. One was, well, um, our God, our help in ages past, our shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home. So our God, our help in ages past was the opening hymn. And then um, I remember talking to President Mrs. Bush. She was in the Oval Office. And I said, how do you feel about the Battle of Hymn of the Republic um, as the closing hymn? And, and I said, um, it's been taken out of some hymn books because it's a little defiant um, and the president looked at me and said defiance is good <laughs> so so we <laughs> ended the, the prayer service with that song and it really I think it Condi told me later that she thought it really steeled us all for you know for the battle ahead um, the we had a big debate discussion I felt it was important well before that let me let me back up and say um, the vice president pulled me aside on Thursday and said, don't you think the president needs to go to New York? And I said, absolutely. And uh, so maybe that was on Wednesday. But anyway, I, I you know, it's, it's really interesting. President Bush always had, in a, and I think about this in light of Katrina, which you remember him flying over and not stopping, and he got a lot of criticism for it. It was after mm -hmm. I'd left. Um, he always had, and I learned this about him as governor, an aversion to going to the site of a disaster because he thought he took resources away from the recovery efforts. And I always had trouble explaining to him and, and telling him, you've got to be seen. You're the leader. You've got to be there. You've got to be the, the presence of comfort. Um, and so eventually both Governor Pataki and Mary Giuliani told him they thought it was really important that he come to New York. I thought it was really important that he go to New York, and so did the vice president. So he finally kind of reluctantly, because he didn't want to interfere with the rescue, right, because um, the operations were still going on, he, he went on Friday afternoon. Um, so again, it was, it's thinking about what's the most important thing we need to do today? What are the signals we need to convey? Um, the next week, um, you know, we were starting to have some reports of people like attacking Muslim Americans or, um, mm -hmm. or hate speech directed against Muslim Americans. And so I was, I felt very strongly that President Bush needed to go to a mosque um, for people to see him, you know, and, and for him to make the point that we should not you know, be taking any of this out on our fellow Muslim Americans, that these, the terrorists pervert all religion with their acts of terror and violence, and they don't represent any religion. Um, and so there was a big debate about that in the White House. Um, some of the people did not want him to do that, um, but, but he ended up doing it. And it was, it's really interesting because years later, um, when I went to the Arab world as undersecretary, people still talked about that, about him going to that mosque. Yeah. Um, so I think that was a very important signal. So, you know, it's, it's it, one, of the, one of the skills that, that President Bush has that I hope I, I learned and gained and strengthened from him is, is clarity. He always had great clarity of focus of what was most important. And I tried to have that same clarity about, you know, what's the most important thing we need to do today? Uh, how do people need to see the president? I realized on the Tuesday morning, the week after the, uh, the, week after the um, attacks, that it was a week and that we ought to do something to, to, memor to, to memorialize that moment. And I, went, I actually went in, interrupted a meeting in the Oval Office. The president was having his national security briefing. And I said, we should have a moment of silence on the White House lawn um, to, to commemorate the attacks. And he looked up and said, good idea, let's do it. And so it was about an hour before the, the hour that it would have happened. And so we gathered all the White House staff and that was the picture on the front page of the Washington Post. And then I think and the New York Times the next day was all the White House staff gathered on the 
on the lawn in a moment of silence for the attacks. So I always tried to think about, you know, what is it, what's most important for us to convey today and how do I do that both in pictures and in words. I mentioned the mosque visit, but there was one other thing that we had a big debate about and um, that I think was really important. Um, and that is that we ended up putting the National Guard in the airports when we resumed flying. And there was a big debate about it. Um, I felt very strongly that a uniformed presence would be comforting to people. To see, to see that uniformed presence, presence would be comforting. Some of my colleagues did not. They thought it would be unsettling. Um, in the, at the end of the day, the president decided to, to, to do that. And it was interesting when, when, um, when they left a couple months later, the head of Washington's Reagan National Airport, um, I, he, there's a quote that I use in some of my speeches and I'll probably, I, I won't get it exactly right, but he basically said, yes, they helped with security, but what was really important was they reassured our passengers. Hmm. And, and so, uh, you know, it's the, I came away with the, the, the strong belief that, that signals like that are so important at a time of crisis. And so that's, you know, thinking through what are the signals we can send in this situation that would be helpful or reassuring or comforting to our employees or to, you know, our, the, the citizens in the community around us is, is really, I think, really important. Yeah, and I mean, it's such an interesting crisis, right? Because, I mean, managing the crisis involves, like, both the projection of, of national power, but also... Of, of of sympathy and understanding, and I, right. I, I remember I remember the mosque visit, and I thought it was incredibly courageous at the time. It's it's interesting that 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 splash back years later when you were when you were doing work for the government in the Middle East that that that's what many people remembered. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but so, along with with they hated him calling terrorists. You know, he, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. but anyway. I, Looking back, maybe we should have said Al Qaeda, but he but he intended it to be more broad. And but it did convey. Um, I realized during my travels to the Middle East, and unfortunately, using that broader term did convey a, a sense that we thought that you know a lot of people told me you think all Muslims are terrorists. And do I you said, think no, that's, we don't think that. Do you think that's something that should have been done differently at the time? Or I mean, could it have been done differently? I just I don't know if you. you no, know, we never discussed it. I don't remember ever discussing it. Um, uh, you know, nobody, I think nobody knew who Al Qaeda really was. And so, the, as, I, as I said, that when he convened that meeting of the National Security Council, he said, we are at war against terror. And from this day forward, this is the new priority of our administration. And I don't think there was, it was ever discussed. Um, I do think it was discussed in Britain. Um, the Alistair Campbell, who was their equivalent of my position, um, told me that, that when the London bombings happened, you know they they talked about them as the I think the London bombings. They didn't they didn't just they didn't cast as wide a net. Um, you mean the the, Ju the July seven attacks? Yes. Yeah, I okay. Guess. I don't remember. Yeah, what the, this is on, on on transit stations and, and buses, yes. right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I think they called them the London bombers, um, as opposed to terrorists. But anyway, um, I don't remember it being discussed. Um, and, and, and probably if it had been, um, I think President Bush probably would have not agreed because um, he wanted it to be broader than Al Qaeda. He wanted it to be anyone who harbored them. He wanted it to be any, any groups that were bent on exporting terror. So, Karen, you work with a lot of uh, both private and, and, and nonprofit organizations now, right? Correct. What are the big lessons from the crises that you worked on at state at the White House that that you share with them? First of all, I'll say you have to communicate clearly and often, even when you don't know all the facts. <laughs> um, you have to let people know that you're aware of the situation and let them know what steps you're taking to address it. Um, and, and uh, you know, oftentimes, and I, I am married to a lawyer, so I say this lovingly to lawyers, oftentimes, attorneys want to say no comment because you don't know all the facts. They don't want to say anything wrong. And that's, I understand that instinct, but you have to be careful that you don't say something that is wrong because otherwise you hurt your own credibility. Um, but, but you do have to say something. 
Um, and and I, my, my counsel is always that, you know, you have to let people know that you're aware of the situation and, and let them know what steps you're taking to address it. Um, another thing is if, if you're not acting in a way that protects public safety, then you're not protecting your own reputation. So you have to do the right things um, to protect public health and safety. Um, if, it's a, if it's a situation where there is a threat to people's health and safety. Um, uh, so, you know, you have to, you have to communicate quickly. Um, you have to, again, communicate credibly and don't, don't make, don't, um, uh, don't make statements that you can't back up, uh, but let people know what you are doing to try to address the situation. The other lesson I would say is don't over reassure. Um, uh, a lot of times people want you to say everything's going to be okay. In fact, um, after my White House, after my briefing on September 11th, the, the, I say no, no good deed goes unpunished. Um, a, a Republican press secretary on Capitol Hill um, was quoted in the newspaper saying, well, Karen Hughes told us, you know, the, the president was safe and, and what the government was doing, but she didn't tell us that we were safe. And I couldn't, that was an assurance I couldn't give. Um, it would not have been credible. We were still under threat um, and I could not, promise people that they were safe. And so uh, you can't over reassure people um, if it's, um, if it's uh, you know, if, if you can't promise that people will be safe, don't make that promise. Um, another lesson that, that I think um, uh, I, I've learned is, is don't try to minimize the situation. There's a difference between putting it in context and appearing to try to minimize it. So for example, during the, the BP's Deepwater Horizon to oil spill, uh, you may remember that the CEO said, trying to again, I think put it in context, but, but making a, re, you know, a bad mistake, um, he said, oh, it's only a, a very small spill in a very big ocean. Well, that is not the thing to say when your company has just caused enormous environmental damage and people are seeing oil gushing, you know, killing, killing fish and other marine life. Um, and, and so I, I would say don't try to minimize the situation. And I go back to my White House mantra that facts and action, you know, tell us the facts that you know, um, tell us what you're acting to do about it, um, and, and don't over reassure or minimize the situation. And then Karen, for, for senior leaders who want to be really involved in, in everything, I, we talked a little bit earlier about how you'd have kind of the senior staff meetings before the meetings with the president. Is it a good idea for a CEO to be sitting in on everything? No, I, I don't think on everything. Um, I, I think there's a lot of preparation that can go um, usually before you bring a decision meeting to a president. There's a lot of preparatory work that goes into it. You have staff debates about it. You, if you have, if you have disagreements, um, you either work to resolve them or you, um, you bring the two sides to the president. Um, I remember when I went to work at the White House, a friend told me, um, you will never have an easy decision at the White House because the easy things are all decided at the cabinet agencies. You know, only the hard stuff gets to the White House. Um, and, and that's true about only the, the, you know, only after a lot of discussion and deliberation uh, does a decision, uh, you know, memo get to the president. Now that may be a little different in, in a time like a 9-11 where you're responding in the moment, right, right. but a, a policy decision has been pretty thoroughly vetted by the time it gets to the president's desk. Thanks for your service, but also that was just, that was a really wonderful way to spend an hour. Okay, great. Thank you all very much. What an incredible conversation with an incredible public servant. I literally got chills when I first listened to this interview live, and then I got them all over again listening to the recording. Karen's unwavering understanding of her role and her responsibility to the American people is truly impressive. I mean, we've talked about this before, about how great leaders convey truthful information in a way that instills both hope and reassurance to those following them. Karen really hit that nail on the head when she talked about the great clarity she had knowing that she needed to brief the public with facts and action. She, she talked about the facts, meaning, you know, distilling an overwhelming amount of data being processed in the wake of a devastating terrorist attack 
by leaning on her staff to relay pertinent information. And then she talked about action, meaning she knew she had to voice all of that information and what the administration was doing in response to an American public. Michael, what's your take on who should be communicating the facts and the action during a crisis? Well, Shireen, in addition to having the right message, in a crisis, you need to have the right messenger for the moment. And those are just a few of the aspects of what I call the four M's, which is message, messenger, medium, and the moment. And you heard Karen talk about seeing a desolate downtown Washington on her way to the White House and then entering the emergency bunker and seeing that the federal government was continuing to function. And she realized the reality of what was happening was in stark contrast to what the public was seeing. And it was important to let the country know that their government was functioning. And the conversation that took place between her and Vice President Cheney and Condoleezza Rice was an important one in terms of who should be the right person to brief the country, to let them know that the government was functioning. That was the message. But the decision about who delivered the message was equally important. And so the decision for Karen to brief the country as someone who's trusted to speak on behalf of the president was a very important consideration. And that's something that plays out in the corporate sphere as well. When we create a crisis communications plan for an organization, we spend a good amount of time determining who are the right individuals that are authorized to speak to the media on the company's behalf. And Karen's story is a great example of why that's so important. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of Inside the War Room. We'll be back next week. You've been listening to Inside the War Room, Case Studies in Crisis. Inside the War Room is produced by global communications firm BCW and global investigations firm Kroll, a division of Duffin Phelps. For more information about this episode and to learn more about how you can work with BCW and Kroll to prepare, respond, and recover from a crisis affecting your organization, visit our website at itwrpodcast.com.